Uh, bear with us. A new mic. It's going to work better. Thank you. Everybody can hear me. Oh, that's so good. I'm so relieved to be here. Okay, so now we can solve our microphone issue. I'm going to begin my talk. And I noticed uh, most of you, a few of you are new to me, so my name is Pat, and I'm filling in today for uh, Mama Jim Pup, who's away for a few weeks on retreat. And those, so for those of you who are new, welcome. And yeah, some of you are familiar with because we did thousands of them for our teacher for his birthday a few years ago. And it's called um, Archid Lamsa. So the tune is a little bit different. So I'm going to sing it three times and it's if you, uh, if you don't know it, no worry. And then after that, um, Sasha's going to lead us in prayers. So. Praise the Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, foe destroyer, best gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, 
Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endow with the knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like a stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion. Omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightnings and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, 
and virtues we have collected through the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niratayami. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus, I did hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Vulture's Mountain on Raja Griya, together with the great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Alokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Alokiteshvara, how should, son, should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom he said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Alokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharivadi Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as an empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisoha.
Taita gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Chariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Alokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice in the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the venerable Sharivadi Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Alakteshvara, those surrounding in entirety along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and yadarvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. And this morning, we have a lot of I'll also include where the Buddha was going to Dalai Lama, or Chanta, and one of Lama has a really good teacher's job in the tradition. And I hope that you can talk to the entire set of questions and comments. Of course, questions that you can answer at this time. I'll bring you to Lama. So, in preparing for this talk, I have some agenda that I think the most beneficial question that I share is only. Um, this one's a little more clear. I'm not sure. Is it? Oh, is it? Is it? It could be me. I have a soft voice. Now it's okay, but could you start over? We couldn't hear you at all. Oh, could we ask our friends online if they can hear me? Now it's really okay. Now oh, it's good. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, I'm so glad for the uh, online audience to let us know that they can't hear me. That's so important. You're helping everyone when you let us know this. Oh, that's good. It's perfect now. All right. That's wonderful. I'm so glad we can resolve it. Glad we have more than one microphone. So um, in our tradition, um, so, so I'm not sure what you've heard or not heard, but let's keep going and hopefully it'll all make sense as I go along. 
Can every can everybody hear me now? I'll pause a moment. I'd like to get some feedback from the online audience. Can they hear me? Yes. They can. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, you know, I think it's really important uh, this first part that Lama's words. I'm going to say them again. It can't hurt to say it twice. Not the whole thing, but just this one part. Lama says he says this. He says, uh, relative bodhicitta is when we have a consciousness that says, I am helping others, or I must be a Buddha to relieve suffering. And he says, this is a very necessary quality and must be cultivated daily. And then Lama said, absolute bodhicitta is the spontaneous and unselfconscious presentation of compassionate activity. He says, it's like the child playing in the garden, the absolute mandala, the kindergarten. So bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word, and, we, and I think it's good to say it twice because this is in our tradition, uh, as Lama says, bodhicitta is the beginning and bodhicitta is the end. So we can't say it too much. And, and to understand what it means is so important. A bodhisattva is one who pursues, pursues Buddhahood in order to benefit others and who out of great compassion deliberately chooses to stay in samsara and work for the welfare of all sentient beings without exception. So in our tradition, compassion is considered both a practice and a result. Ultimate bodhicitta is the interweaving of emptiness and compassion. And he says, without this altruistic mind, it's not possible to become enlightened. So a few years ago, our heart lineage teacher, Jado Rinpoche, visited, and he gave an empowerment called the Thousand Armed Chenvizig Empowerment. And following this visit, Lama Jimpa gave a talk entitled, We Are All Breathing Together. We Are Sharing Each Other's Breath. I mean, that's actually happening right now. In this very room, I'm sharing breath with my friend Susan Farrar and Bradley and Sasha. We're breathing together. And when Jada Rinpoche was here, it's, we, we think, oh, it's so remarkable. We're sharing the air, the very air with our heart lineage teacher, uh, Jada Rinpoche, and also with Lama Jimpa and all of our friends and people that are going to become our friends. So he asked us, he asked us at this talk, he says, this is uh, really important because this is how Lama talks. He asked us, what's it feel like to be fully alive? And he asked, what keeps us going? That's such an important question. This life can be so difficult for some of us at one point or another for all of us. And then he joked, revenge keeps some of us going. That's what he joked, <laughs> and I could relate to that a little bit. So that's, um, he, he likes to joke a lot about the things that hold us back because it helps us keep going too. He, sa he asked, well, actually he said, what, what makes us reach out beyond our comfort zone? And he answered the question with this, what keeps us going is bodhicitta. He says, bodhicitta is so powerful, it has the capacity to carry us through even our darkest times. So I'm going to pause here because I don't want to keep going without making sure that everybody can hear me. So, um, friends, online friends, can you let me know? <laughs> I don't have a computer in front of me, so I'm going to rely on my in-house and out-house. Oh, oh, thank you. You know, uh, I think we have some. We have a few issues to uh, resolve later with our, our technology, and so our friends online and in house are going to are helping us actually because we're seeing oh before our, our some of our major events we can work things out with your help. So thank you everybody for your feedback. All right, so here we go. We're going to keep going. <laughs> so as bodhisattvas, kindness and compassion inform our speech and our actions, but we also ask questions of ourselves. We are. We are like detectives or scientists in our own lives. For example, all day could be our practice if we really are mindful. When we eat lunch or drive our car or when we feel threatened, especially when we feel threatened or especially when we feel insulted or maybe hurt, we can, this is an opportunity. We can search for this I that is driving or eating or hurt or insulted or who feels embarrassed. That's a big one too. That's a really... A, 
potential, a lot of power there for an enlightened moment. <laughs> so we can do formal practice on the cushion and, and we need to do this. But we can also throughout our day practice. This investigation takes a lot of time actually. We wish to go to the mountaintop in a helicopter, but that's not the way it is for most of us. To cover our whole territory takes a lot of patience. And in this way, our whole life becomes practice. And with this search, a sense of humility arises. And also at the same time, a sense of wonder, because life becomes different when we think of it in this way. Through shamatha and this investigative process, we begin to plant seeds. And we notice glimpses of freedom from attachments and from fixed ideas about the world and how it should be. And we fall down, we fall down daily, but in small ways, hopefully, but sometimes big ways, but we get back up. And as we practice relative bodhicitta in our interactions with friends, strangers, and sometimes with our enemies, ultimate bodhicitta, uh, oh goodness, and sometimes with our enemies. So ultimate bodhicitta requires something more, more uh, a little bit beyond this just being, trying to be a loving and kind person. And that's why a teacher is essential. And, but we need to meet the teacher halfway. We receive the teacher's teachings and his blessings, but in the end, we have to do the work because this is not a savior model. Lama Jimpa cautions us with, Buddhas do not wash away unwholesome deeds with water, nor do they remove the sufferings of beings with their hands. Neither do they transplant their realizations onto others. Teaching the truth of suchness, they liberate beings. So that's so important because especially I'm a very slow learner. In fact, I've been called a turtle. And I even have a turtle on my shrine because I learn super slow. But at the same time, I've been told I'm, I'm diligent. I learn slow, <laughs> but I stay with it. And so that's what each of us can do. We can all stay with it and not be too hard on ourselves, hopefully. So traditionally, the process to realization is divided into five paths. And in the third stage called the path of seeing, the meditator through concentration sees reality as it ultimately is, directly seeing the emptiness of phenomena. It is at this place that the mind is free from the reification of I and other and is able to express true selfless compassion. Relative bodhicitta is a state of mind in which we work for the good of all as if they were our mother. Or um, some of us aren't, don't, don't feel extremely close to our mother, so it could be another person that we cherish. And we are motivated by deep love and a wish to relieve suffering. We make a vow to, whatever, to do whatever we can to help. We can make this vow every morning before we leave our door. When we go through the drive through and a person waits on us, we can notice them. We can acknowledge them. We can say, good morning. I really hope you have a great day. Before we can take this step, though, we need to first stop harming ourselves. Because if we are harming ourselves, we won't be able to take this step. So first we practice individual liberation with an emphasis on not harming ourselves. At this stage, we are developing our actual daily living skills. So in our second step, the focus becomes broader. So we can't skip the step of not harming ourselves though. We move beyond ourselves with a sincere wish to help others. With this aspiration, we enter into the Mahayana or great vehicle, and we are willing to work with others and for the benefit of others. We experience a sense of gratitude for our fellow travelers. And if we're fortunate, we begin to recognize that we need their help too. They help us see where we are on the path because without their reflection, like, you know, like if we just stay home in our safe little cave, we might imagine that we're further along than we really are. So we do the same for them, and together we learn to deal with the large and small hassles of life, and through these exchanges become more patient, more compassionate, flexible, loving, and free. We have actually become professionals, but we need guidance, because the path can get quite treacherous, and our intentions may be good, but inadvertently we could make things worse. This has been my experience. I've made things worse. and. I thought I was being kind, but it actually was being what a word I've learned and wanted to turn away from what's called codependent. <laughs> but uh, that's for another talk. 
So Cho Kim Chung Po Rinpoche, one of Lama Jinpa's early teachers, coined the term idiot compassion. So idiot compassion is a tendency to give people what they want instead of what they need. You do this because you're trying to get away from your feeling of I can't bear to see them suffer. So you're actually doing it for yourself, not for them. And this can get complicated because denial can have many, many layers. Lama Jinpa says that the Vajrayana path is about transforming encounters with the shadows of others and also with the shadow that exists in ourselves. He said, oh, he's something else. <laughs> he, really, he really is something else. He can um, make everybody in the room feel a little bit challenged and also loved simultaneously. He said that the Vajrayana path could be compared to the alchemy involved in turning lead into gold. It's transformative, liberation, bliss. With Vajrayana practice, we develop vision and pure non-dualistic wisdom because we can all become stuck in ordinary anger, ordinary jealous, and so on. And a lot of times, people on the Vajrayana path get discouraged. That's been my case. Because in the beginning, things appear to get worse. But things are only appearing to get worse because there's this process we call of transparency. We are turning the lights on, and so the dust that we didn't see before becomes really vivid, and it can feel very messy. Lama Jimpa often talks about two tracks or two rails. On one rail is the idiot mind, and on the other rail is the inner enlightened mind. In Vajrayana, we do not try to get rid of the idiot rail, like I've been trying for 12 years. <laughs> Most other traditions, he says this, he says, most other traditions try to do this because there's this idea of transforming darkness into light. There's the idea of getting better and better and better and better. But in our tradition, the Vajrayana tradition, we leave that behind. Basically, that is the idea of winning. Lightness wins over darkness. But in Vajrayana, complete idiots and Buddhas both remain. And the path is one of complete transparency. We have everyone here, everyone without exception, absolute and relative bodhicitta simultaneous. Bodhicitta is not about being a saint. Bodhicitta, I'm, I'm, I, I'm reading, these, are, these words uh, I, I want you to understand are, are not mine, and that's, so as I read them, I'm hearing Lama's voice. Some of them are mine, mostly not. Bodhicitta is dynamic enlightenment. In Vajrayana, we like to catch ourselves being ourselves, and we let others catch us being ourselves. I hope this talk's not too long. I have no idea. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, read a little bit more, and then I'll, I'll pause a minute in case uh, you know, if anybody has something they'd like to ask. Me. So in a recent in a talk, uh, the book, the book, uh, the Dalai Lama. In almost all of his talks that I hear anyway, he always talks about bodhicitta. He mentions it in his uh, preliminary talk before he gives a talk about just about anything, it feels like to me. So um, in a talk that I heard from him a number of years ago, he said, uh, I'll just read what I've written. So in a talk on the Bodhisattva way of life, His Holiness turned to chapter 9 of the guide, the wisdom chapter, saying, that all the Buddha's 84,000 teachings were taught in order that people could develop an understanding of reality such that they could purify their minds of all defilements. To overcome ignorance, that is the basis of disturbing emotions, like attachment. We need to know how things, how thing, we need to know things as they really are. His Holiness recalled the advice of an American psychotherapist, Aaron Beck, that when we are angry or attached to something, about 90% of our anger or attachment is mental projection. The view that accords, this is the Dalai Lama's words, with Nag Nagarjun, Nagarjuna's, so I'm not pronouncing Nagarjuna's name right. I feel like that. I should get help with that. Could you help me? Am I saying it right? Oh, I am. Oh, good. <laughs> so thank you for the feedback on that. So we get caught up with how things appear to us instead of seeing them as they really are. Looking back to chapter one of the guide, His Holiness said, it explains the awakening mind of Bodhicitta the ultimate wish, to help others. It involves an aspiration to achieve enlightenment that is not just wishful thinking, but is based on knowing that being a real help to other beings is possible, but we need to give growth time. That's why I chose this quote from the Dalai Lama, because 
I've been taking such a long while. <laughs> and, you know, that's encouraging to me to, to realize that that's all right. So Tibetan Buddhists maintain that there are two main ways to cultivate bodhicitta. The seven causes and effects that originates from Maitreya was taught by Atisha, and, it, and the second way, exchanging self and others, taught by Shantideva and originally by Manjushri. So before I, I just, um, I copied and pasted these two ways. So I just want to be transparent about that. Before I read them to you, um, I want to pause here and um, if there's any comment or feedback or other, if not, just keep going. So I, I'm going to need help from my in-house or my, or Matthew can help me, I guess. Does anybody here need, have a comment or a question, Matthew? Or anybody here? <laughs> yes. You're fading out. Oh, Jack. Um, actually, Jack had a question. I'm going to repeat it since he doesn't have a microphone. Jack, could you ask again? Oh, actually, it does. But if you have a question, that you're really reminding me of my job as a speech therapist. And my students often ask me questions other than what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so, Jack, hold your thought, because it is important. And I will, I will answer it over a cookie. Okay, so, so, that, so Jack actually uh, stuck his neck out and asked a question. That's brave. Thank you, Jack. I'm going to just keep going, I guess. Is that all right? We'll just keep going? OK. OK, I, I, I didn't uh, realize that. OK. Oh, so, so there is no hands raised, so that's fine. All right. So uh, if, if something comes up for you, you can uh, you know, indicate it to, to Matthew through chat, and then Matthew will help me stop. Is that a good idea? I think so. OK. So, so like I said, there's two ways to cultivate bodhicitta in our tradition. The first way that I mentioned through Atisha is the seven causes and effects. And the way of generating bodhicitta that originates from Maitreya and is taught by my Atisha has the following seven points. So this is something you can look into for yourself. Recognize, number one, recognizing beings as our past mothers. Recognizing all beings as our past mothers. Two, remembering the kindness of beings. Three, a sense of gratitude for, the kindness, for their kindness. Love is number four. Five, compassion. Six, a sense of responsibility. And then bodhicitta, generating the mind of enlightenment. And then those first six points relate to the causes of bodhicitta, and the last one is the result bodhicitta itself. So the second way, is exchanging self and others. The second way, exchanging self and others, was taught by Shantideva and originally by Manjushri. So in the text, the Bodhisattva way of life by Shantideva, uh, Shantideva was uh, he was a famous scholar and also, um, I feel like I don't want to read this so much because that's what I always, uh, lean, I lean on reading my, my talks because I don't feel I know enough to, to speak on. <laughs> of the top of my thoughts, but just in, without reading this, I'll just say that uh, Shanti Diva wasn't highly thought of uh, as a practitioner. Uh, he went to a famous um, university called, he was a prince, and then um, he later became a monk, and he went to a famous university called Milanda University, and his uh, fellow classmates thought he was uh, not too bright, actually, <laughs> because he, he not only did he uh, he didn't help out that much. He stayed to himself a lot. He didn't appear to be reading anything. He didn't appear to be studying or meditating. He just appeared to be hanging out. And his fellow monks thought he should go. And so they decided to play a trick on him and ask him to do a teaching. And um, they were very confident that he would fail. And uh, so he, he agreed to their request. They had the head person ask him to give a teaching and then he agreed to it, and they, they, just to make it especially embarrassing, gave him a high throne so that he'd be real visible to everybody and kind of making him into somebody important. And so he, on the day that this was to occur, they said, do you 
want to give a, a sutra teaching or an original teaching? And he said original, which they were quite surprised by, but also happy about because they were certain he knew nothing. And, uh, and then in this, in this teaching, he gave the most amazing teaching, which became a text that uh, I, I have studied and many of us here have studied, and Geshe Damcho teaches it sometimes called, I, I'm going to just call it the English uh, title, Bodhisattva Way of Life. And um, I'm hopeful that we can talk Geshe Damcho into returning and teaching from this amazing text because uh, we all benefited so much when he did that a few years back. Isn't that so? So, um, so, anyway, so that's all I wanted to say about that. But as you can hear from the title, The Bodhisattva Way of Life. Uh, that says a lot right there, right? So um, now um, many, um, so I'm just going to go into about you guys. <laughs> many of our Sangha members serve our community. Helping in this way is what we're called to do. But I noticed that Lama Jimpa also uses another language when he talks about bodhicitta. Like I said in the beginning, he said, uh, Ultimate bodhicitta is the kindergarten, the garden, you know, like that's not how we talk about it. And um, he also talks like this. He says, he talks about freedom, like being free, like what would that feel like? You know, like I feel pretty wound up, but you maybe can't tell online, but people here on certain can tell that I feel a little frozen. <laughs> I certainly don't feel free yet, not yet. And um, he talks about energy, and he talks about breath, and winds, and drops, and he talks about us imagining we're flowers, and that our inner channel he does this practice called so long, it's very advanced practice. That, that's like a stem of a flower, like a flower. So, Lama Jimpa embodies bodhicitta. And then he is a window. He's this metaphor, of course, a door, a mirror. He's whatever is needed for that student or that community member, or that client, because he's a therapist. He's whatever he is needed to benefit the situation. Everyone in it, everyone in it, not, not some more than others. And then he invites us to participate in this magical dance called life. Lama's most persistent construction to me, and I believe it would be for any one of us actually, that's why I'm sharing it, because it's this talk I don't want it to be about me. But he says over and over, stay, tattoo it on your wrist, stay. Because sometimes, you know, if you're a little anxious or something, you might find yourself without even realizing suddenly out the door and you're like, how'd that happen? And then, yeah. <laughs> and so how did that happen? I'm, go I, you know, when the event, the event is, for me at least, very minor usually. And it's, and then, then leading makes it big, of course. And then that person's like, did I do something? And then I'm the cause of suffering. He says, stay. That's where the bridge is. It's waiting. At Lions Royce Dharma Center, we have nurses, students, attorneys, teachers, doctors, social workers, volunteers, just mothers, people that love animals. We have some people who work with people who are dying. I just can hardly believe that they can do that every day. We have others visit people in the hospital. Some listen to the brokenhearted or the addicted. Others help children struggling in school. Others bring groceries to those who have fallen on hard times. Others give an encouragement to those who have lost their own capacity to encourage themselves. All of these things have been uh, directed towards me at one time or another. I had groceries here at Lions Roar. I had no food 10 years ago. I didn't even know anybody. All of a sudden, they have 10 bags of groceries. It's so overwhelming. Our members do this and many other things. And we understand this kind of compassion. As bodhisattvas, we look for things to do. This is Lama's words. He says, as bodhisattvas, this is our, <laughs> this is for us. As bodhisattvas, we look for things to do. We look for people to serve. And at the same time, we understand that suffering only comes to an end when a person is awake. And how does this look in such a person? No matter, this is, we've seen teachers like this, and some here sometimes have a glimpse of this. In such a person, no matter what is happening, no matter how difficult the road, it's going good. 
they remain completely open to life, they say, <laughs> and all that it has to offer, the good, the bad, the sad, and even the horrific. Bodhicitta is the union of compassion and emptiness. It is not simply a feeling or emotion. The fourth century Asanga defined bodhicitta as intention, which is a, a really amazing word. It's the commitment to wake up for the benefit of all beings, to free all sentient beings from samsara. And we make a vow that no matter how steep the climb, we will never give up. I love a quote from the 14th century Tibetan master Longchenpa, where he says, Bodhicitta is freedom from the confusion of blindness and reactivity, a freedom in which all choice disappears and we simply respond to the struggles and needs of others according to the circumstances of their lives. This love is not based on desire, it's selfless love and sees with equanimity that all beings wish to be happy and fear suffering. Courage does not mean that we are never afraid. It means no matter how steep the climb, we will never stop. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche used to say that the real practice is what we do when no one is looking. Lama Jimpa says that with Mahamudra and Dzogchen, everything is there. When we say that we are home, we mean we are at home with the body, we are at home with the world. We do not have a sense that things are not right, nor do we have a sense that things are incomplete. We return to sharing our home and our idea of home. We are willing to welcome others. To love is the best protection for yourself and the greatest gift you can give to others. The second necessary quality for relative bodhicitta is compassion, which is characterized by a feeling of sadness when you see someone suffering or in great pain. This compassion stimulates us to do whatever we can to eliminate both for ourselves and others suffering and its causes. For compassion to be genuine, for compassion to be genuine, we must see and understand the suffering and experiences of sentient beings for what they really are, illusion. All interdependent phenomena lack inherited existence and are thereby empty. And finally, a few words from Lama Jimpa, nature of mind is the mind free of all distraction. You don't hear a great Dzogchen master saying, I don't know what to do next. They teach. You, they teach. You, everyone here, are the eyes of the world. So everywhere you go is home. Amazing. Everywhere is home. And here at Lions Roar, that is our program. So before closing prayers, I want to mention that on Wednesday, October 27th at 6, we will come together online and in person at 6 to celebrate one of our major Buddhist holidays, Oh, gosh. Labab Duchin. Is that right, Susan? <laughs> Lamala would like us to... So I'm mentioning this now before announcements because we're going to do more announcements at the end, but I'm mentioning it because he told me, he said, we can use the story of the holiday to explore our own journey. So according to the legend, which actually I, I don't know it that well. I just found out about it, looking into it this morning, and it wasn't... I want to know more. This is very brief because I don't couldn't find it. So if anybody finds a, 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 a story online that they could share, I would really like to learn about this story. But according to the legend, the Buddha ascended, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, heaven, temporarily at the age of 41 in order to give teachings to benefit the gods in that desire realm and to repay the kindness of his mother by liberating her from samsara. So he went, the, he went to heaven to help, he traveled to heaven to help, help his mother. He was exhorted by his disciple and representative, Magalayana, to return. And after a long debate and under a full moon, he agreed to return. He returned to earth a week later by a special triple ladder prepared by this Wakarma and a god, the god of, oh goodness, I'm kind of butchering this up. So um, I just hope you can get the idea of it and not pay attention to the way I pronounce things. But. This event, I hope if you're able to, that you can come on Wednesday, because this event, whatever we do on this day, is multiplied by 10 million. So uh, whether, whatever uh, kind of action we do, whatever loving words we uh, use uh, are multiplied on this day. So the actual day is the 24th, but we're celebrating it on the 27th, all of us together. Is that right, Susan? Is that the actual? Oh, well, in that case, that's even better because we're celebrating it on the actual day, the 27th. So uh, please join us if you're able to. 
um, you really do make a difference. Your, your presence really does make a difference. All of us together really do make a difference. So this morning, Lama asked me these questions related to the holiday. He, and I couldn't find the answers. So I want to, I'm asking for help, and you might have to do a little research along with me. But he asked me, why didn't Buddha initially want to return to Earth? And then he said, or he asked, what did his students say, particularly his chief student, to convince him to return? And so on a personal level, I tried to answer it for myself. Why do I want Lama to return, for, return from his retreat? I know I need him. I need his guidance and his teachings. And even though one day he won't live here all the time, I know he'll come back on a regular basis. And I promised him that all of us would care for each other and protect our sacred temple and our home as we wait for his return. So, okay, so that's my talk. And I, I'm so apologetic that I have to read these talks, but that's where I'm at at this point in my path. And um, I'm gonna just give a, a moment here for comment or question. I've got Jack in the wings. He's gonna ask me a question um, when, we have, when we sit down and have some food together. Don't forget your question. So does anybody online have a question or a comment or um, anything? And then if not, we'll do prayers. Asha will lead us again. Oh, do we do announcements before prayers? Is that typical? Oh, so, okay. So friends, I'm going to um, list the announcements that I have. And then if I forget something, I'm going to count on my uh, friends here and then online to help me. So today at two, from two to five, we're going to continue our mantra rolling for our large Shakyamuni Buddha statue because uh, Geshe Damcho and Lama Jimpa are really counting on us. We want to get our statue uh, with the, these mantras. He's, uh, because of COVID, we weren't able to do it as quickly as we wished to. So if you're free from two to five, come join me here and join others. And then the other announcement, which is so amazing, is um, we've been waiting so long, and uh, we, we understand that the teacher is always with us, whether he's here physically or not, but we can't help but be excited that Jada Rinpoche is coming here from December 2nd to December 5th. And um, you know, he's traveling really far, and he's bringing it, what's called an entourage. That means he has an attendant and a translator, and I'm not sure how many, but it's very costly. They're coming I'm so far away. So if you're able to help support this, this, uh, this occasion in any way, we are so appreciate it. And then, um, then there's going to be, uh, for refuge students and, and a few special guests that help us on a regular basis, basis there's going to be a volunteer meeting on October 24th. And there'll be a link sent out by, by Connor, I imagine. So those are my announcements. Yes. Oh. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's important. So, so Sunday, uh, we won't have a regular talk, but I hope you'll still come and help us with, with your energy because uh, we're going to have a volunteer meeting and we need everybody's help because, yes, yeah, so some, uh, so it's just, we're going to take care of those of you that can't come. So if you can't come to this volunteer meeting, you can rest assured we're talking about you and how we can help you have a good time with us. So. That is all that I have as far as announcements. Is there anything else that? Well, I just have one other one. Happy birthday, Jules. <laughs> yes. And um, OK, so, oh, yes. Oh, um, I guess so. Uh, yeah, we we'll just share this. So I want to say thank you for such a beautiful talk. It was like you were speaking to my heart directly. It's really beautiful. And um, in, the, in the beginning, you were talking about how um, our conventional bodhicitta helps us get out of our comfort zone to attain enlightenment. I wish I was wondering if you could speak more to that because I think a lot of us here, I know myself 100%. So when I get irritable or discouraged, um, it can be really hard to find the motivation. The bodhicitta is always, um, just, it, it always gives me my courage. And you're someone who inspires me a lot. I was going to be speaking more to that. Thank you, Patty. So, um, 
So Jules was asking me, you know, you know, when, when we got discouraged, how to get out of our comfort zone. And, um, you know, sometimes I can't on my own. So what I do is I call a friend and um, I have them help me remind me about, about, you know, just, just remind me that, that I belong. That's, that's what I do, actually. I, I call a friend. I, I try not to do as much as I used to because I realized um, in our, I was leaning too hard on certain people and getting to be known as being like connected with one person instead of the Sangha. So um, now I, I look to my practice. I meditate when, when that happens. But sometimes if I'm feeling especially discouraged, I will call a friend and uh, they don't necessarily have to know my story. But just hearing their voice reminds me that I belong, you know, and they don't necessarily have to hear my junky stuff because, but sometimes they do. Sometimes it's important so they can help me unravel the kind of story I'm telling myself because it's often not true. So that's what I do. Are there any questions online or comment or anything? Oh, well, I, I say thank you back. And uh, like I say that, we really do need each other. I, I know that this is the case for every one of us. So um, I'll just wait a, just a moment more. And uh, that bodhicitta is such a good topic. And I, I just wanted to say one other thing is that if you listen to the Dalai Lama, if you just go to YouTube and um, you can, or go to his website, the Dalai Lama has a, a website. There's all these teachings. He's always, if you want to understand bodhicitta, he, he will help you. He's always, he's always talking about it. You can even do a search, bodhicitta Dalai Lama, and there you go. Bodhisattva Dalai Lama. Okay. So I'm going to bring the microphone to Sasha so she can lead us in prayers. Okay, I'll just speak into the microphone so everybody can hear me. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has risen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful chin rising, tins and gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless com compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Song Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so so that's it for today, and and, and those of you who are here, we're gonna we are gonna we have coffee and tea, of course, and um and those of you online, it's a fall day. It's my favorite time of year. I, I bet it's some of your favorite time of year. Finally, no smoke and a cool day, right? So. Um, Thank you for attending this talk, and I look forward to seeing some of you next Sunday and others of you the next Sunday. Okay? All right. Thank you, Pat.